Welcome back to the new area at Homemaker's No Dig Garden and it's eight weeks exactly since we were last here and it's been a significant eight weeks with lots going on and we've seen all sides of the spectrum. The good, fantastic new growth, especially in the last three weeks when it's really the warmth has picked up. The bad, that's the rabbits. We're getting a bit overwhelmed with them, as you'll see, quite a bit of damage. And the ugly, that's the bindweed. <laughs> I find it ugly anyway, and it just keeps coming back at you so much. And so you'll see some strategies we have to keep the bindweed at bay. We're starting in the herb garden, which last time we were here had hardly grown since we transplanted these herbs that we got from Jack and Vicar mostly. They went in the ground March 18th, and we were there April 24th, not much of move, but now, wow, it's fantastic. It's lovely to come out here now. There's a lot of the thymes and sages are flowering and there's a general abundance. We've been using mint for the teas and uh, the, the walking onion is doing its walking, <laughs> all sorts of things like that. So this is fun. And with the no dig method and a bit of compost mulch on top, it's growing well. Herbs like rich soil, a bit of a misunderstanding there. Most plants like rich soil and you just get more of them. Looking here, we can see, compared to last time, quite a bit of black polythene. And I don't like using plastic or polythene in my gardening. In fact, in my main garden at home, because you hardly ever see it, we don't use it. But here, because of the bindweed, we're using it quite a bit and it's solving a lot of problems. And it's actually the certain vegetable plants really like growing through holes in the polythene. Look at these potatoes, uh, you know, really fantastic. And they've only been in the ground for uh, six weeks or so. We planted them quite late in um, early May. That's right, yeah, it might be seven weeks. And at first they were slow and now they're really getting going. The polythene keeps it a bit warm. Rainfall that falls, quite a bit of it trickles through into the little holes, which are just slits that we made. The potato shoots find their way through, but look what it's saving us in terms of weeding. This bright yellow leaves you're seeing there is mostly bindweed. That, that's all bindweed, for example. So it's growing out of parent roots in the ground, which if you try and pull them, they don't really come out. So that's why it's so hard to deal with by pulling. There's also, incidentally, some thistle here. And uh, that's just being deprived of light, weakens the parent root, which then gradually diminishes in vigor. It's a long-term approach to dealing with perennial weeds, weakening them and at the same time having a harvest. This area here we were thinking not to put bindweed on and I've changed my mind since seeing how much work again. You know this is incredible, it's just two weeks of new bindweed there. We were weeding it by hand before that and I was thinking to maybe plant salads, sow carrots and it's just not feasible. And well, it's possible, but you know, this, this is a, a market garden where we're being a limited amount of labor. So it's a question of how much time you have in it. At this point where you're clearing ground of perennial weeds, the black polythene is a fantastic asset. And this has happened since we were here. Great excitement. A first tunnels, polytunnel, 10 by 15 feet. And yeah, the... <laughs> It's fun to have this here as a more family sized tunnel compared to the one down there, which is more commercial size. And it's what I'm doing in here is, is trying different things. So it, it's an example of um, intercropping and like, you know, we put some French beans between the tomato plants there, for example, tomatoes have lots of different varieties to compare. There's a melon plant there, just one. There's a cucumber plant there. It's often said that you shouldn't grow cucumbers and tomatoes together, but for most people that's not practical because you've only got a small covered space and actually they do grow fine together. And then we have a few plants in pots and chilies. I'm comparing growth of one side with black polythene, one side without, and just see how, how much time that saves. Polythene still comes around the edge of it, the, the bindweed rather. And then a bit of propagation as well. There's a propagating bench there. That's some leek plants mainly. So yeah, lots of things going on in that one space and watered by hand, like everything here we do hand watering. I've got no watering system. 
Uh, this again is a sample of <laughs> the bad and the ugly. So rabbits set quite a few of the beach route towards the top end where they're looking quite small. There was a hole in the net, which I hadn't realized. I've had to really up my game. You know, I've had occasional rabbits. This is serious rabbits. And the bindweed is, is a lot of time needed for actually what's quite a low value crop. If you look to that in economic terms, that's, that's not a goer. <laughs> uh, the broccoli though have been pretty good. And I'm impressed with their growth considering, you know, although we put on quite a bit of compost here and some people would find it a lot of compost, it wasn't high quality compost. It was the green waste, which was still quite fresh at the point we put it on. Something I don't recommend doing, but I was led into it by uh, buying the field so quickly actually and having this all, most of this was unplanned, you know, on the 1st of January, none of this was in my mind to do this. So it's happened remarkably fast really. And like here we've already cropped spinach and that grew nicely. In fact, the best spinach we had was up there where there was a bit of wool mulch around it and that's caused me to think we should try we're going to try some comparative trials using wool mulch uh, you've got to be a bit careful though because you can't grow everything in wool you know you need big space plants that kind of thing and the second planting here is cabbage for the autumn with mesh over i must say i would not be without mesh i find this so useful for keeping off pests in this case the rabbits don't go in there as long as we get enough stones along the edge and it'll keep insects off as well for the early part of their life when they're fragile so within six weeks or so that mesh will come off you can see like the broccoli's got no protection we're lucky here not to have pigeons so it's not all bad <laughs> and the the brassicas i can leave uncovered and at that stage the rabbits are not really eating them but actually what they do eat is fennel leaves and there's some fennel interplanted between the broccoli and you can see how the stalks the leaves of those fennel stalks have been eaten uh, but at this point it doesn't matter so much because the fennel are quite nice and big this is a new planting of asparagus. So that's just two month old asparagus being conveniently used by the pea plants as a support. Uh, this wasn't intended to happen. These were gonna be picked for shoots and partly because they were under a cover, we didn't get to them often enough. And most of the peas actually have been pretty well hoovered up by the rabbits. The raspberries here never happened because I didn't realize, but it turns out that rabbits eat the shoots of new raspberries when they're very small like that. So I should have covered them and didn't. Uh, so it's all a bit of a learning curve. Rhubarb here is doing okay, especially since the rain. So we, it was dry last time we were here. Then we had four inches, 100 millimeter of rain during May. And that was fantastic to be followed by the three warm and very dry weeks. And now it's gone back to more rain again. So nice variation in the weather. These piles are all coming on and we're going to use them as path mulch or compost ingredients in the autumn next winter, maybe even the year after. The bindweed growing through them will clearly be an issue when we're using that wood chip. And what we'll do is when loading up the wheelbarrow, we'll pull out the, the white roots of bindweed. They're pretty visible actually, so it's not the end of the world. It's just a bit of an extra job. And having a a sheet of polythene over a compost heap as well as keeping the moisture in that's very helpful to reduce the growth of bindweed which is happening even we, we've had it even coming three feet high one meter to the top of a compost heap for example wonderful growth here this was like almost like a lawn on our last visit eight weeks ago we've just had the the two months of time and particularly the second half of may in our climate is maximum period of grass growth and with the rain that happened in May the farmers around here have had record crops of grass this year actually it's been quite remarkable what you're seeing there is mainly coxfoot which is a strong vigorous perennial grass which flowers now and makes a really strong root system and it's very good actually as a soil conditioner if you like uh, in perennial terms <laughs> this is a fine example of what rabbits can do when they really get their teeth into the plants. Interestingly, they haven't destroyed the peas. This is pick and come again or eat and come again. Pick your own. <laughs> but it's also interesting how they haven't eaten just these few plants in the middle. And this gives an idea of what these would have been like you know, if the rabbits hadn't got in here. These really nice tall sugar peas, they grow up to about here. And it's a sugar snap 
which I was hoping to harvest. We'll get a few meals off it. Yeah, all of this is not the end of the world, but, and it's, it's great. I feel it's great educational material as well. You know, it gives you viewers an idea of what pests can do. Uh, things are not all perfect at home because <laughs> we certainly have problems, especially taking on new ground, you know, new challenges. Like these onions got well eaten by rabbits again, but again, I would not be without the mesh. You know, the mesh has been fantastic. At, it, in summer, it's cooler than fleece. I wouldn't use fleece in, in this season. The fleece would be too hot. The mesh is much cooler. The rain goes through. Uh, also, I like it because it's visible. You can see what's going on in there, whereas fleece you can't. And sometimes that can things can be going on you might not. You need to deal with. Take the cover off and, and weed, for example. <coughs> the this, this is almost entirely winter squash. So this is food for winter. I'm really happy with these plants. The growth here, I was not sure about because you know it's new ground. You never know quite what's going to happen. I put on not as much compost as I might have liked to. It's around three inches, seven and a half, eight centimeters of compost. You can see the level's not that high. The soil is good here though underneath. It's a heavy silt soil. And the polythene, turns out it's having more of a warming effect than, I've used it before, but I've forgotten really how much it, of a difference it can make. This is fantastic stage of growth to be at for these plants on the 19th of June. You know, the whole summer's ahead of us. I would confidently say at this point there will be a harvest of lovely, mostly Crown Prince winter squash. And down that end, we have a few courgette zucchini plants which are cropping already and they should keep cropping through the summer. So that's summer squash. Many options. Uh, could be other things too that you grow. These pallets I need to remove. You can see how amazingly <laughs> these plants, if I'm not careful, they will grow through and I've even had it once that a, a squash developed between the two wood pieces of a pallet and then got well squashed itself by the, <laughs> the constricting space. This is butter nut here, which is famously slow and I was a bit late sowing it. That's why it's a much smaller plant. I'm not, that's not a banker. I'm still not convinced they're gonna make it actually, but I'm leaving them, we'll see what happens. And then in the last bit here, I'm going to try something different, which is we're going to roll back the polythene. There's actually less bindweed in this corner. So I sense my opportunity. <laughs> Pull back the polythene and we're going to plant lettuce. We're short of space for new lettuce plants at the moment. Um, I will need to secure a cover against the rabbits and we'll probably use thermocrop like we had on this bed here. And um, we'll see in a minute. I just want to mention in passing the, the new pond has permission that came through soon after the last video and it was by then too dry to make it in the summer because we want to puddle the clay so that will happen in the autumn or early winter the new shed has permission too that's going to be between those four bamboos it's roughly four and a half by six and a half meters and that may well be there the next time we visit This one we saw last time, and it's very interesting how it has developed, comparing different composts in one space. So that half of the space is sieved wood chip, half of the space is homemade compost. And the main difference you can see is how much darker green the leaves are, more normal growth with the finished compost. Whereas if you've got too much wood in your compost, you can see the yellow potatoes, the quite small lettuce and the particularly the onions are really really struggling there I don't think they're going to make it the spinach we already took out that definitely wasn't making it and just recently popped in these kale which actually <laughs> didn't get watered quite enough when it was very dry last week and this is the bed that is again new bed on all of this is new within the last two months on the really vigorous perennial weeds we've been seeing including thistles and nettles and two sheets of thick cardboard with the compost on top and that this had more compost than there it had 12 15 centimeters up to six inches of compost and which i also tread down firmly so that you know this is not soft and fluffy this is firm compost which is great and just recently the bindweed started to appear there was no bindweed here for the first six or seven weeks fantastic <laughs> the cardboard was doing its thing but now the cardboard has decomposed enough for 
the perennial weed roots to push up. You know, this is classic no dig and, and how it works when you're using carbodon weeds, which means also though that the vegetable roots can go down into the soil below. The cardboard is a temporary weed barrier, which you only need if you have a lot of weeds. You know, you can do no dig without cardboard. It's not obligatory, but I do recommend it if you have a lot of weeds when you start. And yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. We've pretty well covered this and it's been fun showing you around again. We'll come back here during the high summer or towards the end of summer in about two months time. Thank you.